speeches of Sardar Vallabh Bhai Patel, the Iron Man of India. First tiding first. This was a speech at a public meeting held in connection with the Independence Day. New Delhi, 11th August 1947. Our first task is to stabilize, consolidate and strengthen ourselves and the rest can have only a secondary priority. My colleagues and I have agreed to partition of a country not because of fear or out of a sense of defeat. Under the pre prevailing cir conditions and circumstances in the country, partition on the present pattern was the best thing possible and I have no qualms about it. In a matter of weeks, we have divided the country, the army, the services, etc., and this indeed has been a colossal task. However, I strongly believe that those who have seceded today will be disillusioned soon and their union with the rest of the country is assured. What nature and God has intended to be one cannot on any account be split into two for all time to come. I appeal to you to rub out from your minds the memories of the past two years, deem it as a terrible nightmare and forget it, and to look forward with the single-minded purpose to make India strong, prosperous and happy. This can only be done by hard work. A socialist government in Britain is calling upon the workers to sweat an hour more a day. And the strange contrast here is that our socialists and other preach strikes and encourage wage boosts. This can only result in printing more notes at Nasik and end up in serious trouble. I welcome Mr. Liaqat Ali Khan's latest statement and I am happy that the minorities in Pakistan would be protected and their rights safeguarded. Such a generation will be always good move. I am sure that all the Indian states will join and the Indian Union and none else can afford to keep them out. They cannot remain in isolation. First things should be done first and the first job is to get the states to accede and thereby consolidate the union. The demand of the people in the states for a democratic regime raises an entirely different issue. I cannot see how an Indian ruler can exist with his subjects in hostility and clamoring for popular government. The Congress was pledged to rid the country of foreign domination and after making considerable sacrifices and prolonged suffering, it has succeeded. But the Congress has worked for a united India and a union of all communities and unfortunately it cannot claim any success there. This has been due to factors beyond our control. Our joy on 15th August would have been fuller and greater had not India been divided, but this is not to be for the present. I would make no efforts to explain away the responsibility of the Congress for dividing the country. We took these extreme steps after great deliberation. In spite of my previous strong opposition to partition, I agreed to it because I felt convinced that in order to keep India united, it must be divided now. My experience in the office during the past year showed that it was impossible to do anything constructive with the Muslim League in it. The League represented 
and their representatives during their continuance in the office did nothing but create deadlocks and their role was entirely an obstructive ones besides as i have already once said i found that muslims save for a few exceptions engaged in all capacities in the government were with muslim league thus the rot had set in and it could not be permitted to continue any longer except at the risk of disaster for the entire country indeed at one stage and it obtains even now to some degree things had become so bad with the killing in calcutta riot spread over and it became perilous adventure for hindus and muslims to visit one another's localities the economic life of the country was paralyzed and there was little security of life or property the only way of the sickening situation the congress realized lay in elimination of the third party the british power the british on their part declared that they would quit by june 1948 but that period was long also their statement promising to hand over power to the authorities in provinces gave rise to a various rigorous effort to dislodge the ministries in assam and punjab and frontier the league succeeded in punjab even though they failed in frontier and assam the league movement caused great misery and bloodshed in order to settle the issue immediately and to prevent slaughter of innocent people the congress decided to agree to the division of the country and demanded the partition of punjab and bengal there was no surrender to the league threats or the policy of appeasement today the partition of india is a settled fact and yet it is an unreal fact the partition i hope however removes the poison from the body politic of the country i am sure that this would result in seceding areas desiring to reunite with the rest of the india india is one and indivisible one cannot divide the set or split the running waters of a river the muslims have their roots in india their sacred places and the cultural centers are located here in india i do not know what they can do in pakistan and it will not be long before they begin to return most of the opposition to the congress in this partition came from the quarters which had never been in the past given evidence of any strength despite the division it must be remembered that we have 80% of the country with us which is a compact unit with a great possibility 20% has gone to over to pakistan and i wish the state all success and prosperity i wish them to be strong because then alone can there be friendly relations and amity between the two states there can be no friendship between a strong unit and a weak link india harbors no ill will towards pakistan and will in fact do all in our power to help the new state the main task before india today is to consolidate herself in a well knit and united power the obstacle of foreign denomination is now gone but there are serious problems that confront us economically india is in a sad plight the war has resulted in making india a creditor nation but that does not mean much the united kingdom is our debtor and owes a huge amount but she is not going to pay anything for the moment or in time to come in fact the big powers have so arranged their economies that smaller and poorer countries remain at disadvantage 
The socialists in India are always talking of socialist republic. Instead of restricting their activities to mere agitation, I would ask them to take over the administration of one province and solve the problems which have arisen in the wake of the prolonged war. In contrast to their counterparts in Great Britain, the Indian socialists are pursuing an opposite course. Strikes are encouraged and higher wages are demanded. If there is no water in the well, none can draw any to drink. By all means, let them take away the wealth of a few rich in the country, but to what extent would that effort any relief will bring any relief to the poor, the teeming millions. The need of the hour is to increase the wealth of the country, and this can be done only by putting in more and more hard work and thus increasing production. This requires maintenance of peace in the country. For one, yet now there has been disorder in the country. Now that the Pakistan has been established, there is no quarrel between Hindus and Muslims. If, unfortunately, there should be recurrence of this strife, it would not be cowardly killing of innocent people, but a battle between two armies of the states. I appeal to the people not to indulge in mutual strife, but to create a calm atmosphere and engage themselves in constructive activities which are essential for building up a new India. As regards the states in question, the cooperation of all the rulers is necessary to consolidate and strengthen the Indian Union. When the foreign power had been eliminated, the princes will have to adjust themselves to the new democratic order. The days of those rulers who do not command confidence of their subjects are numbered. The majority of the states have acceded to the Union, and I appeal to the rest to join the Union before 15th August. States which do not come in now, but may have to decide to join later date, would have to accede on different terms. These days, no states can afford to live in isolation. I ask the people to exercise reserve in judging the role of the princes in the present juncture. The rulers have not been free up till now, and many of them do not even now believe that the paramount sea is lapsing on 15th August. Many of them, being descendants of the great and benevolent rulers of the past, I have no doubt they would not hesitate in pursuing a correct policy and becoming popular rulers. Our problems are mainly domestic. Ever since I was released from prison, I have been saying that the imperialism is on the last leg, not only in India, but in Asia. The British are quitting India, and I think the Dutch imperialism will meet its end in Indonesia. There cannot be in the future any more separate electorates or weightages and special treatments. Every community must get what is due. But if a community which forms 15% of the population has 60% of the representation, say in the police department, it is undoubtedly going to create a problem. As regards agitation for cow protection, I agree that the demand, but I ask no such agitation should be sponsored. There was no such agitation sponsored in the past. In countries where the cows enjoy no legal protection, they are looked after much better and yield more milk. But at a time when the government are fixed with the problem of protecting human beings, the question cannot be taken by own priority. I deprecate attempts which are supposed to unite the country, but in fact divide the Hindus. Nobody today except the Congress can undertake the task of uniting the country. 
India has nothing but goodwill towards all. But if her safety is endangered, she must have the strength to defend herself. And for this, popular work must come forward. People must work. All must be together.